All right, Hurley Burleyites, welcome to the pod. We've got a hell of an addition for the show for you today for so many reasons. But the first is this. The very first 45 single our guest this week ever purchased was Elton John's The Bitch Is Back. And she still thinks it's a banger. And she's right. I'd like to welcome Carolyn Wilkins to the Hurley Burley. Carolyn is currently an external member of the Financial Policy Committee of the Bank of England, appointed in June 2021. She is a senior research scholar at Princeton University's Griswold Center, not the people that went to Wally World, the Griswold Center for Economic Policy, and on the board of directors at Intact Financial Corporation. Prior to these appointments, most of you will know Carolyn from her distinguished 20-year career at the Bank of Canada, serving as senior deputy governor, the bank's G20 and G7 deputy, and member of the Financial Stability Board. Now, I just want to caveat that Carolyn is speaking with us in her personal capacity today, not on behalf of the Bank of England. And we're going to dive into a few timely topics. Financial sanctions, what are they? How powerful a tool are they? And how the hell do they work? And they don't call it crypto for nothing. We'll spend some time demystifying cryptocurrency. Carolyn, it's a real pleasure to have you on the Hurley Burley. Thank you for taking the time to do it and welcome. It's a real pleasure to join you. I'm a big fan of your, of your podcast. Oh, well, that's very flattering. Thank you. Now you've made my day. Um, how are you and where are you? I'm very well, thanks. I'm actually right now sitting in the Bank of England. Uh, we are here this week for uh, some financial policy committee meetings. So I'm uh, in a building that has a lot of tradition, long tradition. Hmm. What's, uh, what's England like right now? Is the pandemic over? Is everything just normal? like it used to be? People feel like it's over. Uh, if you judge by the number of people wearing masks on the street or in, in uh, transport, it feels like it's over. Um, and uh, and the bars, so the pubs are, are, are filling up again. Well, well, that's one of the better parts of England, right? The pubs? It is. I was out on Sunday. The other part is that it's so, it feels like spring here. So I was out on a bike ride on Sunday and saw some flowers coming out on the trees and flowers coming to the gardens. It's uh, it's another place than, than some parts of Canada anyway. Hey, I met you at the Bank of, I met you at the Bank of Canada. Where do you come from? What part of Canada are you from? I am from a small place outside of Peterborough, Ontario, which is kind of between Ottawa and Toronto. And it's a place that has a blue sign, no population, it's called Selwyn. Uh, and I grew up uh, most of the time on a on a hobby farm that my dad uh, had with my mom and uh, on the crossroads of, of my street and the highway 507, there was a gas station and a small restaurant and I actually worked there. So my first job was, was uh, pumping gas. You ride a horse? I did ride a horse. Wow. I had a, I had a quarter horse and, and I uh, used to ride her around on the back of back hundred and, uh, yeah, I haven't ridden in a long time, but uh, that was something that I, my sister and I really enjoyed doing when, when we were kids. Yeah, people who do that get a lot of joy from it. Yeah. Um, so how'd you get into economics? What took you into <laughs> economics? That's, that's a really good question. Uh, I think when I was 12 years old or 14 years old, I never would have predicted it. Uh, I thought I wanted to be uh, an engineer. Uh, Manager of a gas station. Different. <laughs> but, but uh, it's 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 funny because I've always I've always uh, loved math and and I was uh, not too bad at it at high school, uh, but at the same time I was very interested in people as well. Lots of social issues at the time. You probably remember, you know, the Young, Young Offenders Act was uh, had a high profile. Um, you know, uh, a lot of social issues kind of came across our dinner table as we talked, and and I thought that economics and was a way to marry that mathematics with, with social issues, things that, that mattered for people. It uh, wasn't very remote for people, but still had that rigor of science behind it. This is how much change has gone on, Carolyn. The opening line of the bitch is back is, eat meat on a Friday, that's all right. You'd have to explain that sentence to anybody younger than us. You probably would, along with lots of other things, like what's an, what's an eight track and what do you mean you had to dial into the internet? <laughs> yeah. 
So we booked this discussion uh, some time ago, and there's so much that we wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk to you about inflation. I wanted to talk to you about climate change finance. I wanted to talk to you about central bank mandates. But to be honest, that's all kind of been superseded for now by the invasion mm -hmm. of Ukraine. Um, and I thought having you on the show was an extraordinary opportunity for my listeners to learn about the economics behind the West's battle um, on behalf of Ukraine. Um, so is it all right with you if we explore what's going on there and what impact that might have? Sure. It's top of mind for, I think, almost everyone. Okay, cool. So let's start with, can you explain to us what SWIFT is? Absolutely. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, as, a, as a company, it's a cooperative run out of Belgium. And what it does is it it uh, provides a messaging service so that financial institutions can transfer money. You want to make sure that the instruction you get to send somebody a hundred million, a hundred billion dollars uh, is actually the right instruction, and it's not it's not a fraud. And so it's a trusted service that's used worldwide. Uh, by many financial institutions and central banks to do cross-border transfers. And so and so the move that everybody saw um, many ad advanced economies, including Canada, take to, uh, to not allow certain uh, Russian financial institutions to use SWIFT puts a lot of sand in the wheels in terms of their ability to make international payments. And that, that's, that's a big deal. Can you make it tangible for me? What's something that r normally Russia would have done that it now cannot do because it's not part of SWIFT? Well, uh, if if um, if a Russian bank wanted to get U.S. dollars because they needed to meet an obligation they had to to pay someone uh, in U.S. dollars, they would be unable to to get those. Uh, if if they wanted to provide services to to their customers. Um, of credit, somebody who's Russian has a credit card. We have, I have a MasterCard. I go, I go to London and I use my MasterCard. Well, if, if I was banking with a Russian bank and I, that is part of these sanctions and I went uh, to uh, buy a coffee with my credit card in London, it wouldn't work. Uh, and so, and so it's very significant. I think part of that as well is, is the fact that the central bank has also been put on a list uh, where where transactions are not going to be allowed. Yeah, I want to get so to that, that. I want to get to that in a second. Okay. That seems yeah. Okay. Yeah. So on so, SWIFT and, though, um, yeah. like, does this affect the Russian people or the Russian government? It affects both. At the end of the day, it will all land uh, on the Russian on the Russian people in terms of uh, stress in their economy. So so if you just wanted to take the financial sanctions as a whole. Uh, including SWIFT, uh, the, the sanctions on banks and individuals, as well as the sanctions on the on the central bank. Um, together, that will sp spell trouble for the the Russian financial system, and we've seen that start. They, they've had to keep their stock market closed for for days because of the of the turmoil. They've had a massive uh, depreciation in their currency, the the ruble. Uh, that that now the central bank will be unable to offset or will make it very difficult for them to offset it. That's going to show up uh, in in Russia in in terms of slower growth and higher inflation and quite quite high inflation. You might have read that the central bank just raised their their policy rate to twenty percent to right. combat that. So so it's hitting it's hitting uh, these these uh, people hard. Uh, and and that's that's by design. It's interesting that SWIFT seemed a week ago like it might be a bridge too far to remove Russia from SWIFT. And now it seems like a tiny step that was taken. Like I'm, I'm inferring from your comments that like much of what I've read, people are saying that the central bank gambit is more significant than SWIFT probably in terms of its impact on Putin. Is that correct? Yeah. I think it is. Uh, they're they're both very significant. They're both uh, gestures that that indicate uh, you know acts that have not been uh, or sanctions that have not been imposed on a G 
20 country. Uh, and so that in and of itself is significant. But when you think about what a central bank does, okay, so the central bank is going to be there to, to set monetary conditions to keep inflation under control. Plus they're going to provide banking services to other institutions, other, other central banks. And by cutting the, the central bank of Russia off, they can't do things like, uh, buy rubles from a Western bank to support its value. So when it falls 30% and they need to buy millions and millions, they won't be able to do that from a Western bank. If they have one of their major banks or any bank that needs US dollars, can't get them because they don't have any correspondent banking services left, while well, their central bank's gonna find it really hard to do that for them. And you might, you might recall, it's not just Russian banks that need US dollars. Banks around the world operate with U.S. dollars, and so in times of tur turmoil, there there are swap lines or, or facilities that are there to help provide that liquidity if there's trouble in markets. Those won't be available to them this time. While we're talking about central bank mandates, one of the things that's been of some controversy in Canada was the central bank's role here in loaning money to the government or facilitating loans to the borrowing by the government uh, during the um, uh, unexpected run-up of money uh, of expenditures during COVID. Um, is, the, is one of the impacts on the Russian central bank that it is unable to help finance the Russian war effort? Well, they'll still be able to issue whatever they want in their own currency, so that's not going to be a problem. I think the issue for the the government to finance its its debt or to have that working is that is that foreign banks are not allowed to trade those securities so they're not allowed to to interact in that market so it's going to become more expensive for many reasons for them to issue and, and we've already we've already seen that um, but their ability to do it my understanding is that they still still would be able to do it um, i would just go back to the premise of your question and, and just say for, for Canada, and that's another subject, that the quantitative easing can be mistaken for just funding the government. Uh, but in fact, the way it's designed and the way it was designed uh, in Canada uh, was really to first stabilize markets and second, achieve the, the, uh, the inflation objective. It wasn't uh, intended to finance government debt that the markets otherwise didn't want to didn't want to buy. Okay, I don't want to go down that road. I thought they backed it, though. I thought they backed some of the bond sales or promised to buy them from the people who bought them. I thought they were supporting the government's borrowing in some respect. Well, it does. It, it does, it does uh, support it, yes. Okay. So this point, though, about SWIFT and the Russian Central Bank. So uh, the Ukra invasion of Ukraine isn't the only crisis going on in the foreign policy crisis going on in the world. We have, for instance, the looming geopolitical economic battle with China. And you mentioned just a few moments ago the U.S. as the world's reserve currency. And how important that is, frankly, to the United States and to the countries like us who are part of their orbit, that it is the reserve currency of the world. There's tremendous benefit, as I understand it, that comes from that. Um, and I read that even before the invasion of Ukraine, China and Russia were working on an alternative to SWIFT that would be designed by them for them. Mm -hmm. So is one of the net results of the action that is being taken against Russia in this context likely to lead to less influence for the American dollar in America over time? So no reserve currency uh, lasts forever. We know that from history. It used to be the sterling and, and, and now it's the US dollar. It has been for many, many decades. Uh, so so there's a couple of parts to that, that question. I would say that, that the, First, the meaning of what it, what is the reserve currency? What does that mean? It, it just means that countries who have foreign exchange reserves, which they're, they're going to have because they need to make sure that at all times they can pay for their imports in the currency. And so, and so um, they tend to hold a lot of U.S. dollars. But also when you, when you 
when you do international trade, it's often also priced in U.S. dollars. So there's kind of two two sides to it. And so, so what Russia did in 2014 when, when there was a threat then that they would be disconnected from SWIFT is that they built their own uh, messaging system. And it's up and running. And there's about 400 Russian banks that are a part of it. Uh, there's only a handful, not a handful, but 13 or so, and there may be more as we speak, uh, foreign banks part of that. Uh, and so right now that messaging service really just services inside Russia transactions between financial institutions. But clearly where they want to go is to hook up with the Chinese system and then, and then have that messaging service uh, be distinct from SWIFT. So that means that they won't be vulnerable to the sanctions. Uh, so, but you got to remember that, that SWIFT doesn't actually make the payments. It just makes the message. So they need to build other rails to, act, to actually make the payments. And they haven't been built yet as far as, as, far as I know. Uh, but China with its own digital currency uh, and, and sort of longer term plans uh, yes, you can imagine that that uh, that part of the world would want to build rails where they weren't dependent on uh, on the U.S. dollar as much. That being said, um, to be a reserve currency, the bar is really high. Uh, to be a major reserve currency, uh, it's even higher. And so, what it means, say, um, people ask all the time, is the renminbi is that is that going to be the new reserve currency? And you know, you, you never say never, but the lift for them is, is really strong. And that's because for people to want to invest in, your, in, that, in that currency, have it as their foreign reserves and rely on it, you have to have a well-developed financial system and you have to have predictable uh, enforcement of laws and a legal system. And you also need to not have capital controls, at least not capital controls that are, that are unpredictable. And 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 they're just not there yet in that in that regard. Uh, so so I, I see that as as a a really longer term issue. I think now the bigger the bigger issue is this bifurcated world that we're starting to build, uh, where we've got technology in the east and the west not necessarily aiming to be joined up at the end because of security. We've got payments on the same you know on the same page, and so. And so that benefit from globalization we had by having an integrated rules-based economic system is, is eroding very quickly with this situation. As somebody that worked a lot on the G20, that must be disturbing for you. Well, it's, it, David, it's, it's, it's disturbing and it, it's heartbreaking. And it's first, first and foremost heartbreaking for the people that are involved in the conflict in Ukraine, it's just horrendous to see what's happening. It's also, it's also hard to know that the people that you sat around the table with, I mean, I sat at Basel developing liquidity rules, which would bore you to death if I talked to you about it, but imagine there's, there's 49 people around the table from all over the world, China's there, Russia's there, you know, others, and, and we're hammering out liquidity regulation that never existed before, and we managed to do it. And now all globally active banks follow these liquidity rules. And we did the same thing with FinTech where we did a study. China was, was extremely useful on that group because they, so, they were so far ahead in terms of how to think about the risks and the regulations. And, and you think about being at that table now, or the same with the G20, and being in that G20 table now and looking across the table at people who you, you don't feel like you're 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 on the same side anymore. Clearly, with with uh, with this, um, and here I'm talking about Russia with uh, with the uh, invasion. It's it's uh, clearly um, not on the right side and, and unprovoked, and so. It's it's heartbreaking to witness that. I, I I mean I've met the the and and spoken with the central bank governor of of Russia and uh, and uh, so these are people. Um, yeah. And he and he used to be somebody you could do business with and talk rationally yeah. with, and now yeah. they're. And I yeah. think we I think we accomplished a lot. I, you know, 
One thing that I've witnessed, though, over the last over the last year, that happened with the G7, uh, finally being able to to accomplish, uh, come together and accomplish that minimum tax for for uh, internationally active firms, uh, particularly tech firms. These are you know these are times where where um, some past relationships that maybe had been taken for granted or or hadn't been leveraged as well as they could have been. Uh, are now showing their value, and uh, and I know what it's like to be in the in the war room at the center, at the Bank of Canada when COVID hit and when 2008 2009 hit, and those people that you know you sat across the table with maybe you had a beer with them maybe you had two beer with them, two beers with them. It's it's so important when you when you phone them up and I and I know right now. Um, the people at the Bank of England and 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 the Bank of Canada, everybody involved is is working, you know, at the Treasuries. They are working 24/7 seven and leveraging all those positive relationships that have been built up over years. That is always tricky. Eh? What is the plural of beer? Is it beer or beers? It's always difficult to know that. I never get that right myself. I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea, but. <laughs> Just assume there was more than one. <laughs> so NATO countries are also targeting the Russian oligarchs personally, going after their personal assets. Is this to annoy them by denying them yachts and fancy shoes so that they bug Putin to stop the war? Or are these guys financing the war? I, I don't know the answer to that question, so so um, I can't I can't uh, I can't tell you yes or no. Uh, I, I think that the these people um, have channels through which they can they can um, transfer money, and so not only is it to send a very strong message about about um, supporting what happens when you support this effort. It's also trying to to make sure that that uh, there aren't back channels, obvious back channels, to get around some of the sanctions. Um, but how effective that is uh, going to be, and uh, you know the exact motivation related to uh, what those oligarchs were actually doing with the funds, is something that you'd have to ask the security the security officials about, because and the anti money laundering folks. And because they would be the ones that would be tracking that. So for a few weeks now, we've been telling a story about 5G and how our presenting sponsor, TELUS, believes we're at a critical inflection point on how we get this fifth generation wireless connectivity right across all of Canada, not just in our big cities, but all rural, remote and indigenous communities. We've thrown technical terms at you like 100 megahertz caps and mid-band spectrum and other concepts like spectrum squatting. And maybe you're listening and thinking, well, these things don't really apply to me, Mr. Hurley Burley. I don't squat on any spectrum. Tell me how this affects my family or the job I do. Okay, then. This is Chapter 6 in our story. How 5G gets from the farm to your fork. Agriculture, farmers, ranchers, and all associated agribusinesses are in the midst of a digital revolution. The entire sector has an opportunity to use 5G-enabled technologies to dramatically improve the world's food supply safely and sustainably. Real-time, precision farming practices, which help immensely in the fight against climate change, and the connecting of all the links that make it possible for a carrot to get from the farm to your table far more efficiently. Stuff like an autonomous robot that uses lasers to target and destroy 100,000 weeds an hour without disturbing any of the soil or actual crops? Or how about a tool that uses cameras to identify and count insects in the field in real time, so instant decisions can be made about treatment without significant crop loss? It all has the potential to add $40 billion to our GDP within the next five years. There's just one problem. Right now, only 37% of households in rural and remote areas of Canada have reliable connectivity. And as you know, Hurley Burleyites, that's where farmers live and produce the food we eat. The feds are having public consultations right now on how to auction this new critical mid-band of 5G. TELUS believes the faster we get it to every single household in Canada, urban and rural, 
the faster we all benefit. The story continues next week, but you can have your say right now at telus.com slash get 5G right. So I'm just curious about this and how this works um, in real terms. And if you can't answer this, don't worry about it. I don't know what I'm talking about. But so the pipeline, the steel company in Regina that is making the pipe for the Trans Mountain Pipeline is owned by a Russian oligarch, owned by the same guy that owns the Chelsea football team. Is this going to impact on him or on that steel company in any way? So uh, it depends on the legal arrangements uh, with that company, but it was my understanding, and this is I'm getting this from just reading the same news as you are, that there's a distinction that will be made between the corporate entity and the individual. I see. Sounds like a loophole. So the G, the, uh, you know, the, the wasn't the full G7, but the announcement that was made by the UK, the EU, and, and Canada was on there, the US, um, on the 26th talked uh, about a task force that they were putting together to uh, identify the assets and and freeze the assets of the affected individuals. So um, this is a, it, it's one thing to announce, it's another thing to execute. They know that, uh, the officials know that, and, and that's what they're working on now. Cool. Um, okay, and I know politics is not your sport, and I'm not going to ask you to comment on politics, but I also know that people on the hurly-burly like a little glimpse behind the curtain. Okay? All right. And so we've been reading and hearing uh, that the Prime Minister of Canada and the Canadian Minister of Finance, Minister Freeland, have been very active on this file, talking to their counterparts in the G7 and in other fora, and in pushing for a stronger sanctions package. Um, it's always neat to hear when Canada gets to punch above its weight, maybe a little bit, in international circles. Do you... Do you have any glimpse into the process that has led to these sanctions being agreed to where there was no agreement a week ago? So, so I wasn't part of any of the discussions, so I don't have a direct uh, line into that. But I've been part of other discussions where this, was, this is happening. And I've seen uh, different countries around the table have more influence at some times than the other. And Canada often punches a bunch of above its weight. In these types of situations, what's happening is that there are phone calls, it could be twice a day, it could be three times a day with different with different counterparties. And the way you work these things is you say, okay, I want to I want this to happen. You've got a goal. And I did this when 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 I was working on different policy options during during the crisis. And and then you you talk about it in the room with a bunch of people, the people the G7, for example, and then you have bilateral calls and you try to figure out what is it that they need to be able to come to an agreement? What is it they're worried about? And so if I just read the room, what happened, you, you think about what Europe might be worried about and why SWIFT was a bit longer in coming. They're very dependent on, on natural gas and, and oil um, from Russia. We've seen the 40% number that that's for national natural gas. Germany is is a little bit more uh, reliance than some of the others, but you've got a country like Finland that that's got 75%. So, so it's a big deal to for them financially to to cut Russia off in that way, uh, not only because of the direct effect of what they're doing, but the possible blowback that comes that comes from Russia, and so and so. That's why you see that that the, the what comes out is certain banks from SWIFT, not all banks, at least not yet, and and uh, and there may be the possibility of allowing allowing um, you know energy to be a bit of a carve out, and so and so to getting from you know all banks and every every piece of activity to to. Um, to, to where they came out was a process of trying to figure out what could work for everyone. And it only works if everybody does it. 
right? right? And so you actually need people to come together. There could be someone else that says, okay, I want to have a little bit of a grace period before this comes in, because as soon as it does, if one of our financial institutions on the wrong side of this, they won't get paid. And we want to make sure there's, we're not inducing financial instability in our own, in our own backyard. Uh, and so, and so that those are the types of considerations. I don't know if those were the considerations, but those are the ones that would come to mind for, for me. And so uh, the fact that they came out with such a, a comprehensive list uh, was a sign that, that there's a, there is definitely resolve and there's an ability to get to the same, get on the same page, uh, which is good. It's so awkward when, when morality and the, and the economy are in conflict. Well, I think Biden said it, uh, that, that, uh, that you can't imagine that doing the right thing for democracy for people of Ukraine uh, is, is not going to cost us anything. Uh, but that's where I think um, countries and people of those countries show their values. That's where it comes out. What are you willing, what are you willing to give up? Right. Uh, there's always trade-offs. And in and, uh, this case, uh, it was clear uh, in what happened, the, the kind of trade-offs that, that, that at least the, the decision-makers, the policymakers think their people are willing to make. So the winter out west in the past week has been vicious, and now there are reports of another atmospheric river descending on the Pacific Northwest. Sometimes it feels like there's just no let up. But our sponsor, CN, would like to point out a few realities. Trains must roll, period. That is a non-negotiable central fact of our modern economy. Polar cold and deluges of rainfall notwithstanding. Thing is, a modern train is a vastly complicated assemblage of moving parts. An unexcelled means of cargo transport weighing tens of thousands of tons. A thing that big, and it is one of the biggest things on earth, must roll safely. The term freight train may have become slang for unstoppable, but let me assure you, that's just foolish slang. A train must, must be reliably stoppable. In Canada, that means accounting for some of the harshest weather anywhere, Levels of cold that would quickly paralyze most normal machinery, the sort of weather some parts of the country are experiencing right now. So a CN train is almost over-engineered, packed with technology and operated under strict rules. In winter, now, that requires constant vigilance against the damage snow, ice, and frigidity is capable of inflicting on tracks, machinery, and performance. Particularly with respect to braking, which sort of has to be beyond excellent to deal with the inertia of a moving train. Because deep cold attacks hoses and couplings, keeping air pressure even is critical. CN ensures vulnerable parts are scrutinized and replaced constantly, and the railway uses special cars designed to amplify and regulate pressure along the entire length of the train. In extremely cold weather, trains are shortened, and they slow down. It happens. There is simply no other way to ensure safe, reliable operation. CN never compromises where safety is concerned. So yes, weather can and does slow down a train. But you know, compared to other methods of heavy transport, say big trucks or ocean-going container ships, a CN train is still the champion of efficiency and reliability. That hasn't changed in 100 years, and it won't. So how long are these things going to take really the, san the sanctions package is what I'm talking about to really have an impact. I mean, the news out of Ukraine in terms of the military fighting is dark and it looks like, um, it looks like the momentum is now moving behind Russia. Sadly, I mean, this could be a day to day thing, but this is my impression right now. And so it doesn't look like these, um, sanctions will have any impact in time to actually stop Russia from militarily taking if not the entirety of the Ukraine. So are the sanctions designed to hurt the Russian economy so much that they make it impossible for Russia to afford to hold Ukraine or just to punish them for what they've done? This market actually stop them from doing it. So... Yeah, I think I think uh, I think a bit of both, and and also we can uh, resolve of, of the Russian people uh, for for this um, war, 
and to the extent that they're aware that it's happening. And so, and so um, how fast, I think from a, <laughs> some things are really fast. So, so the US cut the, the Russian central bank off starting today, done. Uh, and so, and so um, that has a very quick effect. Just announcing the SWIFT, you can see in, 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 you see this in reports that financial institutions doing business with Russian banks are actually really reluctant to do it, even if, even if strictly speaking, they're allowed, they've, they've stopped. So, so there's liquidity pressures that are already being put on uh, Russian financial institutions. And, and as I said earlier, you know, there's no way the Russian people won't notice that the, their central bank just raised interest rates to 20%. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's going to, that's going to hit them. And so, and so are the price increases that they come clearly for, for the rest of the world. Um, it's, it's a negative for economic growth and it's a positive for inflation, not a great combination. Uh, but it is what it is. Impact on the average Russian? I heard a story, you know, on the internet, everything could be a, uh, could be bogus. But um, I heard that commuters in Moscow getting to the metro realized that Apple Pay didn't work anymore. Um, and the ruble is tremendously devalued. So I wonder what happens to a Russian citizen who goes to the ATM. Well, they're, right now they're lining up. So what happens first is they wait in line. Um, and so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, their, their credit cards though work in Russia. So, so they could still use those. Um, but I think the worry that they have is that the banks will actually be unable to meet their obligations. And so that's why, that's why there, there's a little bit of a, a, an early run. Uh, I didn't look today, but on, on the banks. For, for, for them, I, I can't put myself in their shoes so easily because it's such a, such a different uh, situation. Uh, but I can't, uh, you know, if you just extrapolate from what, what, um, what we don't have to worry about in Canada, we don't have to worry about our banking system. Uh, it's it's safe. Uh, we don't have to worry about about uh, anybody freezing our accounts, at least at least not internally. And and uh, and inflation is is uh, higher than I know the central bank would like it to be. That's what they've said. Uh, it's nothing compared to what Russia has already and what they're going to be facing. And so and so, if that's the target, and I think given what leaders have said, if that's part of the reason, it's not punitive to people, individuals to, to be mean. It's to try to change the tide in terms of sentiment about what Russia, Putin is doing. How do citizens normally react to a rapid devaluation in the currency? How do they usually react? Right. I'm wondering if this can lead to riots or demonstrations or or uh, pressure on the government domestically, this rapid devaluation of their of the ruble. Well, it makes everything that it, it makes everything that they want to buy internally and externally way more expensive. Uh, that's that's number one. And there's nothing that people notice more than you know when they go to the grocery store. <laughs> all of a sudden, either there's supply chain disruptions, so it's not there, or they go to buy a loaf of bread, and it's it's unbelievably expensive. So, so um, that for sure is something they're going to notice. Uh, whether that, whether that turns up into into demonstrations uh, in unrest, I, it's 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 uh, cultural, uh, I guess. <laughs> so, so, uh, but uh, it's coming on the heels as well as a really difficult time with COVID. So this is this is kind of and the supply chain disruptions that are already in place uh, because of COVID. And so, and so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a double whammy. I have to say though, that we, we talk a lot about Russia and they're supplying oil and, and uh, natural gas to the rest of the world. They're also along with Ukraine, um, big suppliers of wheat. So in your neck of the woods, it's, it's going to make a, it's, it's going to make a, a, a difference there. They're also uh, suppliers of some of the 
metals and minerals that we use in the technology that we're going to need for for uh, greening the economy. There's a lot of links into into uh, the rest of the world's economies. They may be they may be small, but they're in important uh, areas for uh, some of the other goals that we're trying to achieve. Well, if this whole thing doesn't at least result in 150 truckers descending on Moscow, I'll be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. let's switch to cryptocurrency. All right. Cryptocurrency. Like everybody else my age, I have no fucking idea what it is, okay? Or what one would use it for. Um, or one what one would do with it. So... Uh, can you do a primer for me? What's the point of it? What is it? Well, I'll get to the chase. It's a, it's a, it's a speculative asset, Bitcoin, uh, if you want to talk about Bitcoin. Uh, but if we kind of back up and go, what, what are crypto assets and what's the blockchain? It's, it's uh, basically, uh, the blockchain is just a big ledger. It's just a big ledger. We've had them for, for centuries. So the thing that's really interesting about this particular ledger is that, is that it's distributed in a couple of ways. One, it's literally distributed. There's, that ledger is visible, and the blocks on the ledger are visible all over the world over many, 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 many nodes. I don't know how many. I should have looked it up. And... To get a transaction on the blockchain, it has to be validated, and it's validated in different ways depending on, on what kind of technology they're using. But if it's Bitcoin, it's it's proof of work, which is kind of a a big mathematical problem that takes time. And it's a competitive process, and if you win the valid, you win this this uh, validation, you you get paid for it, and so and so you end up with a you end up with a ledger, a blockchain, a set of blockchains that actually uh, is immutable. You, you can't change it easily. Uh, it means that it's probably right. So if somebody's not trying to spend money two, two different times, uh, like Netflix, I can use my, my uh, password in my house, but I could give it to my mom and, uh, and she could use it too. You, you can't do this on the blockchain. I don't know if anybody does this, but any of your listeners do that, but it's against but, the law. Uh, it's, you, a, it's, against, it's a law. It's against the law, Carol. And I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, I, would never I, do I wouldn't do it myself, but I'm just no. saying that this no. is so, no. so, and, and the thing about it is that the crypto assets are, are designed to do different things, but Bitcoin, you know, started off with, with, uh, you know, claims that it was going to be a new monetary system. It was going to replace fiat currency. So the Canadian dollar would go away and so would the U.S. dollar. And we'd be in this brave new world where we'd have one currency that wasn't dependent on a central authority kind of dictating uh, how much was going to be made available because the amount that, that Bitcoin uh, is going to issue is fixed at a certain number uh, at, at a certain date. And so people kind of cottoned on to that. What I think it's being used for now, if you look at the surveys, is, is a number of things. People think uh, Bitcoin, I'm still talking about Bitcoin, is like a, an investment asset. They see, the, they see it's very volatile, but on an upward trend. And because it's in fixed supply, they think, well, it's going to continue that upward trend. And so they think they're going to make money from it. Uh, it's not used as payments uh, unless those payments, um, well, some of them are illegal uh, for laundering money or avoiding taxes. Um, maybe some Russian oligarchs, you read the news today, maybe moving some of their funds into Bitcoin, hard to tell. Uh, and so, and so, it, it, it's really, it's really something that is becoming mainstream. I have to say, the the crypto assets. There's another s form of crypto assets, though, that have nothing to do with with uh, w with Bitcoin. They're called uh, stable coins, uh, which is another type of crypto assets. Basically, uh, uh, a form of money that's tied to a, a set of assets, so it's backed. So, uh, if you think about Tether or U.S. dollar coin. Uh, they are basically promising uh, that the value will be made stable by its backing assets. And those are interesting, actually. 
uh, because they could be the foundation of a, of a new financial ecosystem where we get our financial services that we know and love, like investment services or lo loans, insurance in a distributed way. In instead of going through a bank, you go through a ledger uh, directly. And so, and so uh, this, this new universe is unbelievably fascinating. Uh, and it's also one where, where um, the opportunities are, are, are there, uh, but so are the risks. And that's why central banks and governments are pretty focused on how to set the right guardrails for this, this new system to evolve. So this is why I feel thick as a brick, okay? Because okay. what's the point of it? What problem are they trying to solve? The people that created these things or the people that buy them, what, what's the point? So a lot of people ask those questions, and I think when it comes to to uh, unbacked crypto assets that are sh purely for speculative purposes, that provide no underlying service, that have no underlying value, uh, I think uh, I'm not sure what service they provide, what net public good they 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 provide, particularly when uh, that proof of work mechanism that I talked about requires use of electricity, you know, some estimates as much as, as the Netherlands. It's from an environmentally point of view, not particularly attractive. That being said, if you've ever seen a diagram of how cross-border payments work, so that what we've just cut off with Russia, okay, those, the number of middlemen or middle people in the transaction is Enormous. You look at it. You look at a flow chart. This is who it goes through. It goes through a correspondent. Go your bank, the correspondent bank. On the other side, it goes through another bank. It's, it's, and that just means the costs just add up and add up. And so the cost for, you know, people who want to send money back home to the Philippines, or they want to send money to their family, uh, um, their their kid who's going to school in another country, they charge, and you know, the the, you know. A lot, okay, and so, and so, and it's purely because it's inefficient. And so, what this technology can do is take out a lot of that middleman business, the and the intermediaries, and and uh, and do it directly. And I find that I find that uh, very worthwhile because that's an efficiency that could flow through to consumers and businesses who may not realize they're getting dinged every time they make a payment, but it could make those payments a lot cheaper and, and increase access to those kinds, of, those kinds of services in a way that's more difficult with uh, centralized systems. So uh, on the other hand, uh, these new things can create, can create risks. Um, so, so stable coins, for example, how do you know that they're really backed? Uh, they're not regulated. Um, one company, the Tether that I mentioned, that is issuing company was fined by um, a, U a U.S. regulator because they had uh, misinformed or outright lied about what their backing assets were. And so, and so this, is, this is something that has potential, but we really need to, to regulate it. Um, to create a level playing field for those who are trying to get in, but also to make sure it grows in a way that serves serves consumers and businesses uh, and not just a way for, for people to, to make money. Until this issue came along, I had never thought about currency as a concept, to be honest, in my life. Um, just accepted it as a given about the way things work. But so when I think about this, I go, okay, so... Since the early 70s, dollars have not been backed by anything tangible. The dollar is a currency that is accepted everywhere because we all agree to trust it. And we all agree to believe in it. And if we stopped believing in it, it would stop being a currency. Mm -hmm. And do these things undermine normal currencies? Can these things coexist together normally? Or is this a transition? Oh, I think they can coexist. I would say that if if you if you want to contrast the difference between um, the the hundred dollar bill you may have in your wallet or not, or the fifty dollar bill, um, 
it's is because I'm not sure there are hundreds are out there anymore. But 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 uh, that is backed by a central bank that has a clear monetary policy objective and a good track record at meeting that objective. Um, for sure, inflation is well above the target today. But if you look over the whole period, um, it's it's been remarkably useful, Very. and that's the case for for many others. So. It's also accepted by everybody. It's the unit of account. Everything's kind of priced in Canadian dollars. It's a good short-term store of value. You know, today if you go to buy a to, to buy um, a bottle of water or a Pepsi, that it's going to cost you whatever it costs, say a dollar fifty. And if you go tomorrow, it'll probably still call, cost a dollar fifty. Uh, it's not a good long-term store of value because there's no interest on it. So you probably that's why. If, you, if you're fortunate enough to be able to save, you you put your money in something that has a rate of return. Well, Bitcoin and many of these others don't share those properties. Things aren't priced in Ether or in Bitcoin in, in the real world. Uh, the store of value from one day to another in the short run is not very good because it bounces up and down so so much. And, and the entity that's backing it does not have a credible monetary policy regime behind it. Uh, it says it does because this is, well, the number of Bitcoins is at the end of the day is fixed and we've got a, a supply um, management system that's going to keep inflation in check. And, and in fact, that's just not, that's just not true. It'll create deflation at the end of the day. And, is not just, uh, and this is going to get really geeky and technical, but it's not just do the it. supply. Do it. Remember Economics 101, David. Did you take Economics 101? I did, but I think the University of Regina denies that. Oh, okay. Well, if you stayed yeah. awake for any of it, you would have known that <laughs> supply matters and demand matters, right? Right. And, and so what they're saying is, well, we, we've got a really predictable line of supply. But to establish a price, you also have to have a predictable or way to understand demand. And so they're saying that their money supply rule basically is gonna is gonna fix it and it won't because demand is just way too volatile. That's why you see uh, the price going up and down the way it does. And it it's not just me saying this. When you look at when you look at the way monetary policy was run in Canada in the in the 70s, okay. We, we actually targeted a money growth rule to try to keep inflation under control. And if and if, if I remember the conversations at my dinner table, my mom and dad, the only thing they talked about was inflation back then. And the reason is, is because the money growth rule didn't work. And so we abandoned that. And that's why now we, we implement monetary policy in a completely different way. Um, and so, and, and so, um, I just don't, it's an elegant thought that they have. So I admire the elegant thought. I just don't think it works. And, and uh, just one last thing, I have an anecdote, which, which is just, it's just everybody who goes to the Bank of Canada, and I did in 2001, kind of mid-career, I think it's hazing. It's a hazing ritual they do <laughs> where they, they say, Carolyn, Take this model. Carney, of, your career is on the line here. We've got a hazing story from the Bank of Canada coming. <laughs> so, so take this this money this money model and try to establish a you know a, a stable relationship between money growth and inflation. That's what they tell you to do. And you can't find it. I spent I spent everybody tries to do this. Steve Polis tried to do it. I tried to do it. There's many people. It's like looking for the Holy Grail. It's just not there. I don't know. Maybe it is there, but I haven't <laughs> found it. And so, and so when, when I go it's back just to the flesh wound, you asked about, pardon me. But it's just a I flesh wound. Bitcoin, yeah. Yeah. It's just not, it's not a, it, 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 I just can't see it. Never say never. There may be someone who comes up with some algorithm that's not Bitcoin where they can do monetary policy without a central bank governor and a, and a full framework and some judgment. More power to them if they can, um, because then the rest of us can can go to the beach. But but I don't see it. I, I, I really don't see it being a credible regime in that sense. So 
Um, that being said, I, I just said a lot of bad things about. There are things about, about this about that Bitcoin. excite you. I know that you're interested in this. I'm really interested in this stuff. And why? I'm in, because I, you, you've been you've been debunking it now for a few minutes. So what is it that interests you and excites you about it? So so what interests me, and and I see this in the Creative Destruction Lab. That's that's. Uh, the stream I'm on is a blockchain st chain stream uh, out of the uh, Rotman School of Management. And, and I see a lot of entrepreneurs who are using the blockchain technology somewhere in their idea to build out an ecosystem. Sometimes it's, it's a decentralized ecosystem, like I was talking about before, in a way that creates an uh, it, efficiencies and creates a new way to provide financial services. And I don't know if, how it's going to turn out. So that's exciting in and of itself. But I do know that, that these people, some of them are pioneers that really want to reinvent how things work. They want to expand. They want to do, they want to do good. And, and, uh, and I admire that. I also admire it because the traditional financial system is as inefficient as it is today because of a lack of investment in in uh, finding new ways of doing business. And so the systems are old. Uh, I think there's still some mainframes out there with COBOL and you know, programming. And so, and so, uh, I like the contestability. I think in a in a in an economy where you want competition, you want you want some contestability to keep people on their toes. Uh, this, among other things, is something that, that can help. Is secrecy a core part of this offering? Because, you know, you mentioned FinTrack earlier, and I, I thought there had been tremendous efforts to make the financial system more transparent um, over the last number of decades. And this seems to be the opposite of this, uh, of that. This seems to be a way to hide major transactions. That can't be a good thing, is it? Well, everything's on the ledger. So if you can, through through uh, forensics, make a link between what's on the ledger and the person or the entity behind it, then in fact, it's, it's potentially even more transparent than the system oh. that we have. Okay. All right. Um, the thing is, is that the tools to be able to do that are are a work in progress or major companies that that's, that's all they do Ch chain analytics or chain analysis. Uh, there's some of the companies that I've seen in the creative destruction lab. Uh, so gray wolf being one of them uh, it, are there just to do that uh, forensics. And, and so you saw in the U S um, the authorities were able to recover millions and millions of dollars that were stolen in, in, 2016, I believe, and arrest two people. So you can find the money. You can follow the money. It's it's. Uh, I wouldn't say. Uh, I wouldn't say that over time there there won't be increased ability to do that. And I wouldn't say that the transparency of the existing system is is perfect either. So so uh, there's always going to be people who want to get around the system. And the the trick for for FinTrack is and the international authorities are to try to keep up <laughs> and, and aim to be ahead. I would say, though, that for that to happen, FinTrack and all the regulators are really going to need the support of, of governments to, to have the right regulatory authorities because it does change things. Uh, they need the support to be able to hire the people to be able to do it. It's... it's I mean, it's it's a completely different world, and so the people that are there are going to be great. They may not be the right people to keep ahead of, of crypto or understand it, and so and so that big lift, in terms of building capacity, is still something that needs to happen, and it needs to happen soon. So what you're, what I'm hearing you say to old people like me, people that are old enough to have bought the Caribou album instead of the Bitches Back single. <laughs> <laughs> um, that this is real and this is here to stay. This is not some weird uh, millennial phenomenon that we can ignore. That some, it may not be Bitcoin, but some version of crypto is going to have an impact on the global financial system. 
I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet against it, it uh, going away anytime soon. Uh, Bitcoin. I. I don't see the long run utility of that. I. I think for for the reasons behind its technology, uh, the purpose that it, it's serving right now is speculation. I can't see that being converted into a fundamental service that that could fuel a financial system. Uh, but other other ideas, yes. I don't want to name any of them specifically, but other ideas, yes. I, I think it's, it's definitely going to lead to something that will change how we do business. And uh, I don't think it's going to replace the traditional system necessarily. It's not what I'm saying, but I do think it's it's leading somewhere. And what I hope is that is that through the work that the Bank of England does and, and other central banks, along with the, the other kind of, there's lots of authorities that need to look at this, that we find a way to, to regulate it, to, to supervise it, that supports its growth as well as keeps, you know, keeps it from harming uh, the people who are involved with it and also the financial system more, more generally. Thanks for all this, Carolyn. I, I, I really genuinely would hope that you would find the time at some point to come back so that we can talk about some of the things we didn't get to, notably inflation and climate finance, both things I'm really interested in, and I know that you're very expert in both of those things. Um, but if I could just end on this note, for those of my listeners who only stopped doom-scrolling Twitter to listen to this podcast, what makes you optimistic these days? What makes me optimistic is that in times of in times of uh, crisis like this, and we saw it with COVID, we're going to see it even more with with uh, the war that's going on. People tend to come together and they tend to hammer out compromises and make the trade offs and tough decisions and have the hard discussions that are needed. That you know they might want to avoid at other times that just don't seem possible at other times. And we so need that here uh, in Canada uh, because I think for the, we, you know, here we are focused on the war, we're focused on COVID, but Canada needs a long-term plan to grow and meet its climate objectives. And that kind of dynamic is only going to happen if we come together. And uh, it's, a, it's a terrible catalyst for that, but, but I think we should. I think we should make the most of it. I hear you. Thank you so much. And uh, and I can tell by that backdrop behind you that you're in an incredibly august setting and therefore must have more important things to do. So I do thank you very much for your time, Carolyn. And it's great to see you and talk to you again. It was a pleasure. Take care. Okay. All right, Hurley Burleyites. Let's thank Carolyn Wilkins and let's thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. And we'll see you next week with more Hurley Birds.